Okay. Think it's fix. <laughs> if everyone's ready to start, help I'm ready to start. My name's Ryan Heath. I write a column for Politico Europe called The Brussels Playbook. Mm -hmm. And before I got involved in that, I worked as the speechwriter for the European Competition Commissioner, a woman who was then called Nelly Cruz. So I'm not expert like these four fine people, but <laughs> I do know a little bit about the topic today. And the way I was hoping we run the session, because we don't have a lot of time, is uh, let's think of it in a competition analogy. You're the customers, I'm the regulator, and you guys are the people who are at risk of abusing your dominant position. <laughs> and by that I mean I will try and keep you on a short leash with your answers so that we can get through as much as possible. Um, but enough of those insider jokes. Terrell, I'd like to start with you. In just a couple of sentences, two questions I'd like you to answer. What has brought you all the way to Lisbon? And what's your reaction to Margareta Vestager last night, where her view was, you can't leave algorithms in a black box. We need to bring democracy back to the jungle of tech markets. Well, uh, I'm here for the Web Summit, of course. And thank you so much uh, for the invitation to be part of the conversation. I think it's a really important one. Uh, I, I thought Commissioner Vestager had a lot of important points to make. One of the things that I guess I'd like to stress is there are limitations to what the competition toolkit can be used for. Uh, some of the issues that we're talking about here regarding the power of the technology companies and the power of the technology in our lives raise bigger, broader questions. So I hope we do get a chance to talk a little bit about algorithms and how to hold them accountable to democratic institutions. I think that's an important conversation. And I think the other part of the conversation is thinking realistically about what competition law can do and should be doing, and then what are the other areas of regulation or consumer protection that we ought to be talking about. Thank you. Andreas, do you agree, or are you of the view that tech companies are just spoiled brats who need to learn to live with regulation and tougher competition enforcement? <clears throat> I firmly believe that th these tech giants have to live with competition regulation like any other company in the world has to live with that. And I think the, the, the problems that we need to tackle is how do we transmit the regulation that is true and valid for the offline world? How do we um, well kind of leverage that into the online world in a way that it makes sense? I think that is the huge problem for us as competition agencies because we see the benefits uh, of the online tech giants uh, we see the benefits for consumers, we see the, the benefits for welfare, but we also see the, the problems, problems with market power, uh, problems with smaller companies who want to compete to the benefit of the consumer, and how to arrange that, how to get that together, how to find the, the right regulation for the online world. I think that is the key problem that, that we are facing. So what we need is a balanced approach, uh, in a way, uh, as we have in the offline world, and we have to, to look for new grounds, new paths, new cases, uh, very little case law in, in, in a certain sense. Um, I think that is our task. Mm -hmm. Ariel, you're the expert at how to make this work. So we're at the stage now where there is a lot of theory, there's a lot of vocal criticism about how some of these companies operate, but have you seen examples where competition enforcers are actually able to keep up with how these markets operate, or are they doomed to always be behind and, and messing up? <laughs> well, b being behind doesn't necessarily mean uh, messing up. I think <laughs> by definition, um, the enforcers follow the technological advancements and the activities carried by the, the companies. Um, the, the main challenge, both for enforcers and regulators, is that we have technology that in many ways changed the landscape of competition. So we have new forms of market power, new strategies that could be regarded as problematic both for consumers and sometimes for other companies operating in that landscape uh, or providers of input. Um, and the task for us is to find or redefine what is the dividing line between legality <coughs> or illegality and once we identify that, <coughs> sorry, once we identify that, what is the optimal way of approaching it? Should it be using ex ante measures, such as regulation, data protection, privacy, or should it be through competition intervention, 
which tends to be more exposed in nature or already. both or or both no I, I mean per item per item what yeah. what is the optimal way mm -hmm. per per problem that you identify um, and a healthy mixture is what we're looking for this is really where we're heading uh, some sort of a healthy mixture mm -hmm. Jacques you were saying off stage that you think that it is fair that competition regulators do be tough that they are seeing a difficult reality and they should tackle it despite the complications of trying to understand that environment. How, how do you think the Belgian authority can do it? How does it work with people like the EU to make that a reality? Well, first, we are, uh, we are a network industry. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we are in a network with, with each other and, and, and with the European Commission. And, and together we know more than we know uh, individually. Uh, Fair, yes, we must insist, and, and I'm very glad that, that Commissioner Westeyer uh, put some emphasis on this, because it's, let's not forget that after the economic crisis, we, um, there is distrust in markets, far more than there was before. I mean, there is distrust in markets. People either do not expect much from competition authorities or too much. And I don't know what's the, the most dangerous. Mm -hmm. we, we need to, to get better in expectation management um, also. But fairness was in the past usually seen as uh, opposite of competition. Mm -hmm. And we were seen as promoting the struggle of the fittest. Mm -hmm. There's nothing necessarily very wrong with that and therefore unfair, that we now uh, go openly and clearly and articulated to see that fairness requires competition. We are on the side of society that ha is occasionally, but only occasionally, I think, um, the, the victim uh, of certain practices. Now, to come back to what has been said before, um, ex ante or not, I think the example was very good. On privacy, on transparency, I think you need ex ante. People have to know beforehand what is expected from them. And so that's regulation and then we rather can than deal Yes, case. yes. And then we can deal with the pathology mm. when things go wrong. Now, a question for everyone, but maybe it's your first right of reply, Terrell. Mm. Um, I get the impression that what we see now in tech is a little bit like what we saw in finance and banking around 2007 and 2008, where tech has become so huge and has the ability to suck up so much talent and pay so much money to that talent that there can be a bit of an imbalance between the enforcers and the regulators versus the industry. Are we facing that sort of challenge? Is that what, do you look and feel like Goliath versus David when you look at this new environment? I I don't personally, I have to say. I think in the U.S., um, we've taken some time to really make sure that we're not only relying on our traditional tools, but enhancing them by bringing technologists into the work that we do, and I find that really helpful. I, it, it's been said by my panelists that antitrust enforcement is inherently an exposed activity, so we're looking at facts, reviewing them, and making decisions. I think we have the capability of doing that, one of the questions then becomes, uh, is that the right approach around all of this range of issues that we're currently talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't feel like David, um, uh, actually not. You must see two things. First of all, we have powerful instruments. Um, if we ask information from companies, they have to reply. They have to tell us the truth. If we find out that they don't, we can impose very, very high sanctions. Mm -hmm. Um, we can bring business cases to an end if they are anti-competitive. We can impose very high fines if we find anti-competitive behavior. So, uh, from this point of view, with regard to the power of competition agencies, I would say within business we are one of the most powerful authorities mm -hmm. that there are, so we have the powers. Secondly, I think um, we have caught up with the industry, with business. Um, of course, everything was new for us as well. Uh, we had other parameters for dominance. I mean, that was market shares and so on. But today we have understood that network effects, direct, indirect network effects, access to data, 
um, that all these issues are competition parameters in the online world. And Germany, as one of the first countries on the world, has implemented these parameters into the law. So we can, uh, we can apply that directly mm -hmm. today. And, and if you look... If I can ask you maybe to elaborate a bit on who does that thinking? Where do those skills come from? I remember when competition economists started to become more important in antitrust cases. Who are the people who actually understand how this technology works? Did you hire engineers? coders? Yeah. Do you want more of them? Um, how do you actually get to, to grips with that? Well, well, first of all, we listen to what is happening in the world. The fact that we as antitrust enforcers are here at the Web Summit, mm -hmm. that is not only for the panel, but that is also, of course, to learn something. You've uh, been warned, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, secondly, uh, we in, in, in my agency, we set up a task force, uh, a, a think tank on these issues, who did nothing but intellectual groundwork, look into technology. Um, when I looked Back some years, we had many lawyers, many economists at the agency. If you look at it today, you find many people who have studied mathematics, uh, who, are, uh, who are experts on, on IT. We have, hired, we have 30 IT people in, in my agency. So we really try to keep our pace. And of course, we look very closely at what is happening. And what I wanted to add from, from this huge bunch of cases that are going on, against GAFAM, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft. You can, also see, you can also see that there's something happening, that competition agencies are active, especially my agency. We have a lot of cases going on. The Google case at the European Commission, the Facebook case at the Federal Cartel Office. So there is a lot happening, and I think today uh, we have caught up in a certain sense with, with business. We have the skills, we have the resources, mm -hmm. and I think we can do it. Ariel, have enforcers learnt enough? I mean, thinking back to the original FTC cases against Microsoft in the 90s, and then Nelly Cruz at the Commission tried to bring them on, um, they seem to be a lot more basic compared to the challenges that exist today. And we've also just seen this year the C European Commission get hauled over the coal coals at the European Court of Justice um, with the Intel case. It may well happen again with Google. Uh, so are you confident that enough has been done to really get inside those black boxes? So there are, there are several levels on which we can, we can try and answer a question which is, is, is a difficult one. Uh, one is the theories of harm. Mm -hmm. And these theories of harm, the majority of them remain the same. So the core idea of what is it that we're having issue with remained very similar to the basics going 20 years back, even 30 years back. And this will be relevant for quite a lot of the um, strategies that we see on the market. Yes. Then we have some instances where you will see maybe slightly novel theories of harm, where you see expansions of theory of harm. Jack mentions fairness, which might uh, in a way be used as an element that might widen at some point um, certain theories of harm to have a wider grasp and, and capture more activities. So this is one area. The other area uh, is that the actual toolbox that competition agencies have. And as we heard, competition agencies are certainly investing. There are a lot of working groups at national level, at the European level, looking at the markets. And it's a challenge which is not only a technological challenge. It is about understanding the technology, but then marrying that information to information about market dynamics, mm -hmm. information about what does it really mean. And competition, by its nature, means that less efficient competitors will be pushed out of the market. And we all accept that. There's absolutely no problem with that. So the aim is to identify whether certain use of certain technology or gatekeeping position or market power mm -hmm. is used in a way that can leverage market power or can affect other competitors and push them out, not because they're, they're not as good, but because you're doing something which we deem uh, problematic. Um, and a third level, which I think is, is rather challenging, is the one of information. And although enforcement agencies have the ability to require information to be submitted to them and have the ability to engage in good down rates to force companies basically to reveal information, um, there will always be some level of information asymmetry mm -hmm. uh, in terms, especially as we move into data-driven yeah. networks and algorithm-driven networks where big data and big analytics uh, are key. So it is possible that although you have access to some information, it might not 
give you the same insights that it gives someone else who is in possession of that information because of the philosophy, the variety, and so forth. Um, and this is a gap that, of course, needs to be addressed. Jacques, is this a case of the algorithms being unknown unknowns? Should you have the right to go into an algorithm? Because it's a bit hard to do a dawn <laughs> ray on an algorithm, isn't it? <laughs> like, it's oh, not yes, exactly... Yes, I'm sure it's tough, but we do have the right. And, and on David and Goliath, let's not forget... David. Have you done it? You've, have you, have David you got to won, an huh? mm -hmm. Not Goliath. So, uh, no, with, an al with algorithms, yes, but we, we did it, but, but very simple ones. So that there's, there's not much merit in that. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we are much smaller. I mean, my, t my, my authority is 55 people. Mm -hmm. Compared to Google, that is really small. But that's not, not so much the issue. The issue is, first, we learn a lot from the parties in a case. They bring us the information. And, and, and it is a debate between parties. So we can cor check what one said in view of what the other said. So we're not that disarmed as, as it may look um, at first view. An absolute challenge uh, is uh, speed. Mm -hmm. we, we need to break, take decisions at a time the interested stakeholders still remember what the case was about. Mm -hmm. and we, and that is a continuous challenge, I think, to all authorities. You can bring forward the useful effect of your decisions, but it will always take a couple of years if you really want to respect the rights of the defendant. Mm -hmm. So how can you align that with the ever-accelerating speed of change? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, that, that is a challenge. Well, is this the case, and to everyone? Are we in a situation where sometimes the cover-up is worse than the crime? Like, I think of something like the Google Shopping case. I don't even know what Google Shopping is. I wouldn't know where to find it on the <laughs> Google system. Probably there's a tab. But anyway, I don't feel like I've ever used it or been abused by it or anything like that. But I do feel that sometimes tech companies trade off the fact that people love their services to essentially explain away whatever real evidence might exist for the breaking of a law or for the existence of harm. So. I wonder whether the honeymoon is coming to an end for these tech companies, where they can't just write off bad behavior because people love their iPhone or love uh, something else that the company has produced. Can I take that question in a slightly different direction? Mm -hmm. Of course, being the American on the panel, I'm not going to comment on the Google case <laughs> in, in DG Comp, but uh, two points. One, um, Don raids on algorithms. I'm not sure exactly how useful that analogy is, no offense, because an algorithm is just a very neutral thing. Mm -hmm. What we need to be looking at is the effect of the use of it on competition. And I think there, the agencies are working hard to get smart. We're working on it around the world, and I think it's really, really important. The other question here, I think, is not whether a honeymoon period is ending, but whether we are entering a phase in which these companies have such a level of market power that we as competition enforcers ought to be carefully understanding how and when they're leveraging that power, whether they are extending it into other markets, monopolizing them, and, and whether we are doing enough to really understand that conduct. Mm -hmm. uh, one follow-up question. So uh, for people who didn't listen last night, Margaret Vestaya, uh put forward the idea that you need to teach an algorithm what it can't do, not only look at what it does do. And so I think that's where my dawn raid point came from, where you, you kind of have to be in the algorithm in order to know whether a company has complied with your instruction that an algorithm can't do something. And maybe it's impossible to tell an algorithm not to do that. But is there any validity in what Vestaya was saying there, or is she on a fantasy track? Uh, so I... I think the idea is the right idea, which is the people using powerful technology need to be able to explain what the technology is doing and need to be able to be accountable to the brick and mortar world laws that apply to them. So I, I see this as a discussion of how do we explain the effects of the technology that we're using. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a really important one to have. But again, uh, for me, it's what is the effect of it and how are we looking at the harms versus the benefit of it in the marketplace? And I think that is a, an appropriate analysis. Now, it may not reach some of the other issues we could care about, such as bias, 
uh, impacts on equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. But those, I would argue, are a little bit outside of competition law and are important policy areas but need to be handled separately. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jacques, then Andreas. There are two, two, two sides uh, to it. I think it's a major challenge to compliance officers mm -hmm. because when we talk about c compliance by design, the burden is on, on them and on their engineers. Mm -hmm. They must try to avoid that it can do wrong things. We are like in the medical profession, the, 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 the surgeons. We deal with the pathology of the market. We deal with it when it goes wrong. I don't think one can expect from us that we ensure that it cannot go wrong. But when it goes wrong, we should be able to act, mm -hmm. hopefully in a way that teaches them to avoid similar problems in the future. Well, well I think, first of all, we should not pretend that everything is new. I mean, competition law remains the same. Competition law is a breathing law that is designed to cope with dis different kind of business models. Of course, we here we have new business models, and we have business models that depend on algorithms. And of course, you cannot do a dawn rate into an algorithm, but of course you can do a dawn rate into a company, and you can ask, what is this algorithm doing? And you can find out what is this algorithm doing, and I'm quite sure that, that we and, and the European Commission, I can only talk for my agency, that we have the people who could find out what, what is happening there. So that is not really new because it's not the algorithm that is colluding, it's the people behind the algorithm who have programmed the algorithm who are colluding in a way. So that behavior is collusive, it's a cartel. A cartel remains a cartel, that is one thing. The second thing is about the honeymoon. Um, I don't know if, there, if, if, if it feels for the companies like a honeymoon is coming to an end. But you must see what Terrell has just mentioned. These are companies who have grown over something like 20 years into companies well, that have a turnover that goes beyond 100, 100 billion dollars or euros, who have 300,000 employees they're active worldwide, they have large market shares, and it is obvious that they are a case for competition agencies and that they are submitted to the same rules as any other company. You know? So I, 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 I hesitate to say that this is all new. We have to look at some new features. We have to look at some new competition parameters. Um, we, when, when, we, when we do a dawn raid, what we, what we used to do in former times, we grabbed the calendar of the CEO. Today, of course, you won't find a calendar on the desk anymore. We, we come into paperless offices. That is a challenge for competition agencies, but we have to cope with it. And we're doing that, we're used to that already for a long time. So it's not all new, it's a bit different. The law has been amended slightly, and I think we can deal with that now. Mm -hmm. um, so so a, few a few points. Um, first, we speak about algorithms, and, and it's important in the context of enforcement to appreciate that the market can correct itself sometimes. Mm -hmm. So even if you put in place a certain algorithm that creates some problems, you might have another company that is able to put in place another algorithm that would actually remedy those problems. So in this new environment, we could still have uh, the same powers of the market, although possibly with market power, this might not be as, uh, as easy. In terms of don't rating the algorithm, from a technology perspective, you can seize an algorithm, you can put it in a sandbox and let it play, and you get a sense of what it is designed to do. But just as Terrell said, one of the problems is that the outside context, it is not always easy to understand, so what is re the real impact? You could, though, understand then if the algorithm is designed to enhance strategies such as um, interdependence between players, if the algorithm is designed to follow price leads or certain things. And then you have a very difficult question of whether this amounts to a problem um, or not. Outside that sandbox, it becomes much more challenging because algorithms are not all linear. We have algorithms that are more advanced. We have, of course, artificial intelligence. We have algorithms that learn through experience. 
So it does become a case that even if you put limiting principles, and most algorithms will have some limiting principles that actually dictates what is the range in which they operate, this does not guarantee that you fully understand what is happening within the process, uh, which enables you to understand what happens on the market. Mm -hmm. Where might this be a concern for us? If it is something that might be used to facilitate collusion, for example, by creating signaling that we as human beings are not aware of, but we have separate companies that are able to signal to each other. Mm -hmm. If we have parallel behavior, some sort of uh, enhanced tacit collusion that is promoted through our algorithms. We have hub and spoke structures where you have many companies using the same algorithm to determine pricing and they just outsource the service to another company. So again, the algorithm might be neutral the way it is used that's a little bit more controversial. Do we have an issue? And of course, the whole element of privatized uh, and personalized pricing, the fact that you can engage in dynamic personalized pricing. Again, there is an open debate to what extent this is a competition problem or a consumer protection problem, but many will accept that th there is an issue there yep. when you can move into perfect price discrimination, the ability to target us exactly and extract all the value that we're willing to pay. So. A lot of new issues that are quite quite challenging is that Carol, space. you wanted to jump in. <laughs> well, I just want to, I think it's an important set of points because there are a lot of new issues introduced by very intelligent pricing algorithms. And I think as antitrust enforcers, one of the things we need to understand is whether that might yield uh, different kinds of very specific product markets. So if the kind of personalized pricing is happening, or say it's more of a... a I think as we would see it in the marketplace, like a group pricing. So a price based on a set of characteristics of a set of consumers, then we might understand that a combination between two companies that are likely to target that one group is, uh, is maybe a different thing for that group than another group. And so we need, to, we need to understand and modernize our own relatively old school brick and mortar tools to this new digital world of competition. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of future tools, we've got five or six minutes left and I wanted to tackle both what might happen in the US context and in the EU context for what we're going to do going forward. Um, Terrell, maybe can you tell us a little bit about uh, the US situation? Um, in the marketplace, in very general terms, Europeans tend to be in an in an inferior position compared to a lot of these big American companies. But I think there's a lot of people in Europe who feel like the European enforcers and the regulators are now the world leaders who are setting the tone and the structure of these debates. Um, is your organization, the FTC, doing enough under the Trump administration? Can we expect it to do something more or different in the coming months and years? All right, so I'll disclaim before I answer this question. Uh, I, I am a federal trade commissioner at the US FTC, but I won't give you the official view of the FTC, and I'll point out that I'm also uh, technically in the minority, so I'm, I'm a Democratic commissioner in a conservative Republican administration. That said, my agency uh, so far is just a 1-1 commission, so we haven't reformed a majority yet. It's a little bit soon to say exactly which direction the FTC itself will head. But I, I think that we are entering a very interesting time in which in the US, as well as here in Europe, we are having a very active debate over the role the competition enforcers must play given the power of these technology companies. And I expect that we're gonna continue to have that conversation. I don't expect a wild change in how we enforce antitrust laws in the United States. I think that will remain a case specific based on facts enforcement approach and that's what i would expect but i think we are we are part of this larger conversation mm -hmm. now to turn to the europeans but feel free to jump in as well one of the big controversies for anyone who doesn't follow this on a daily basis is that in the eu system um, it's not usually criminal cases it they're civil cases where the european commission is the judge jury and the executioner there are rights of appeal to the european court of justice but it's a lot of power concentrated in the eu's hands um, that allows for vestia and her team to potentially be more independent um, than in other systems but also there's a lot of potential for abuse of effectively that system so i wanted to ask each, each of you should there be a separation of the eu's powers um, in regards to this judge jury executioner system and and if so how should it work how would we know the, the new system would be better 
Well, well, personally, I don't believe that we need a change because that is a discussion that we have led over many years and a lot, of, a lot has happened also within the European Commission to make sure that there is a certain checks and balances already implemented in the investigating process within the European Commission. Uh, most visible may be the hearing officer uh, that is taken care uh, within the European Commission that there is a balanced approach at the very end. Plus, I remind you, uh, there is all decisions by the European Commission, like in Germany as well, are fully subject to uh, through judicial review by the European courts. And as you know, we have seen competition cases where the courts have taken another view than the European Commission. That has happened. Uh, so I think there is a, few, a full review. I think every competition agency around the world uh, of in Europe, I speak only for Europe, has taken care that it has internal checks and balances to make sure that we come to a balanced approach. So I do not really see that we need a new approach with regard to that uh, in light in of what has happened in the past and in light of all the changes that we have seen in the past. And quick follow-up, should there be an easier ability to do collective lawsuits and private actions? Uh, do you feel comfortable with the level of burden that is on the we, public we, enforcers? We, we, the we, we, have just, uh, we have just implemented the regulation on, on private litigation uh, in Europe. We are very happy with the result. We see countries where we see more class actions, like in the US and in other countries as well. But these are countries where, from our, my point of view, it's the lawyers who get rich from these kind of class actions. But I've never seen a system where the consumer uh, has really become rich through these oh. kind of class actions. I think the so Volkswagen consumers so might be coming rich so in the US. Uh, so I, I firmly believe that in, in the EU we have taken a very good approach, a very balanced approach with regard to these kind of questions. Quickly, gentlemen. I fully word. agree with Andreas. That's uh, we excellent. Have, we have full separation, <laughs> but I nevertheless fully agree with Andreas on the European Commission and others. <laughs> yeah, just a comment. I, I, I think enforcement decisions uh, so I'm taking it in a slightly different direction. I, I think the important thing is to appreciate that competition agencies are, have a choice to make, uh, choosing the cases and choosing the theories of harm. And with the new technologies, I think it will be interesting to see different agencies, where, they, where do they take that? They do have the mandate, but they have to decide whether it is in their interest, in the consumer interest. And the final word to you, Terrell, the outsider looking in, any tips, advice, complaints about the EU system that you want to offer? Well, I, I don't want to criticize the EU system but please at, do. A, at a European <laughs> tech conference. It's a global <laughs> tech conference. That's it's the a global internet. tech conference. Um, look, I'm an American antitrust enforcer. I think there's some tremendous advantages to the way we approach guarding competition in technology markets while also balancing the tremendous benefit to consumers and the innovative potential of these technologies. But as, a, as we've been discussing here at the panel today, we need to be mindful of changes in the marketplace, the structure of the marketplace, and our really important role in protecting competition in the marketplace because competition is absolutely vital. It's an incredibly important market force to yield innovation, and we want to make sure that that competition is still occurring. So I think enforcers around the world have a role to play, and it's very important that we continue to engage in a dialogue with each other to make sure that we're harmonizing our approaches. We have different tools, we have slightly different mandates, but we all, I think, are really focused on making sure we're protecting competition and doing that in a responsible way. Well, you've all engaged in a great dialogue today, so thank you for being our panelists, and thank you for being an excellent audience. Thank you. You're free. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>